All right, take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Titus, and we're going to turn to the book of Titus chapter 3, Titus chapter 3, and uh, praise the Lord, last week we started our study on the book of Titus, and uh, oh, what a, a joy, uh, what, a, what a book, uh, not a long book, 46 chapters, 3, or 46 <laughs> verses, just making sure you're paying attention, 3 chapters, 46 verses, and uh, in truth, the uh, book of Titus is a pastoral epistle, and it is like a minister's manual, and uh, it's sort of like a how to have the ministry or work on the ministry, and it's tremendous. If you remember the why, uh, the why was the gospel, and the gospel is important. It makes a, a difference in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie. Uh, the gospel to the island of Crete, and there was a ministry begun on that little island south of, uh, of Greece right there, and that island of Crete right there. Paul wanted to get some churches planted, and the worker for that was Titus, and Boy, you need to go into those uh, places right there, get churches started, but you need some good pastors. And it gave the qualification of the bishop or the pastors. They must be blameless, the husband of one wife, etc. And uh, we got through that. Uh, we looked at the doctrine. Remember the chapter 2, the doctrine? The doctrine of being a, an aged man, the doctrine of an aged man. It gives the, uh, the ideal uh, um, man in the church, the aged man in the church, and he should be sober and praise the Lord. He ought to uh, be grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and patience and uh, the doctrine of the aged women. We don't have any of those here at our church. Uh, amen. <laughs> amen, Sister Jessica. Uh, but the aged women, they're there to be holy, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. And the young women, the doctrine of the young women, that they are to be uh, there to be sober, love their husbands, love their children, be discreet, chaste, and keepers at home. And we look at that chapter two, the doctrine. It tells really how each member ought to behave themselves, amen, in general. We get to chapter three, and I can I be excited about chapter this chapter is convicting, and uh, we begin to look at chapter 3, and uh, we're going to read the first several uh, verses, the first four verses of this, and well, just let's stand for reading it. Let's read these first four verses together, and let's read them all together in unison. Ready? This know also, nope, that's Second Timothy. <laughs> It's going to be that night. I just feel it. This I uh, got knives on me tonight, and uh, praise the Lord. Here we go. Try it again. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, verse 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And uh, this is a minister's manual, pastor's manual. And it gets to the point of interpersonal relationships, how brothers and Christ, uh, sisters should treat one another, not just in the church, but outside the church. And in today's society, we want to war, we want to fight, we want to battle, we want to argue, we want to dispute with everybody. Uh, you write a post on, not that I've done it, but uh, uh, you write a post or somebody writes something on social media, you may have somebody agree with you, but you have 10 people that disagree with you. And everybody wants to argue, everybody wants to dispute, everybody wants to uh, just fight. And uh, this tells us, Brother Hatfield, I'm, I'm convicting you this right now, I just see it. You're saying, yeah, Pastor, I really do, you know. This is meant for you, Brother Hatfield. And uh, 
it's going to be good. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, I love you. It's been an interesting evening. And sometimes you allow us to have things not go exactly like uh, they normally would, Lord, and that's okay. Lord, I believe with all my heart you're interested in the service. You've given us this gift of chapter 3. It's convicting because in truth we all struggle in this area. Lord, I pray that you help us to open our hearts and our minds to you. Help us to see how we deal with people inside the church and outside the church. Help us to become better at that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Ah, I put the heading of this uh, for me was we should be merciful uh, because our God was merciful to us. I'm going to say it again. We should be merciful because our God was merciful to us, not by works of righteousness, uh, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. That's verse number five. And you're going to see in these verses, it tells us how to deal with people. Does anybody here at the church ever struggle with dealing with people? Uh, I do sometimes, and sometimes it happens when I am at DMV. Uh, sometimes it is when I am driving. Uh, sometimes it is in my family. Sometimes it is and you fill in the blank. We all have struggles sometimes in our dealings with people, and this is a, uh, a subject that we all need reminders of. So look with me at verse number one. And verse number one, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. And we think about that, be subject. That play, means you're placed or situate yourselves under somebody. And we think about that like a magistrate is a, a, a maybe a government ruler. And it talks about our dealings with people outside the church house, uh, maybe a ruler, a local government ruler, maybe a boss. And you can begin to think about that. We are to subject ourselves and be ready to every good work. Now, I'm, we're going to think about this, biblically speaking, but sometimes when somebody does something that we do not like, we want to argue, we want to fight, uh, we want to go to war with people sometimes. And boy, you can see it sometimes when you are in traffic, and sometimes it comes from inside your own car, and sometimes it's in somebody else's car. But somebody cuts you off or somebody does you uh, something to you, we get uh, sometimes angry or they get angry at you, and you want to go to war. Uh, I'll never forget, I've told it, my dad, we were traveling to Wisconsin, going through a small town in Iowa, and somebody uh, cut my dad off and began to uh, give him some sign language. And uh, my dad, as a kid, he got enraged, and he began to chase this man literally through this small town. We were going in and out of uh, just the whole town at very big miles an hour. I was scared half to death. My dad was so angry. My man finally got out of the car and ran into his house, locked the door, and uh, it was a difficult situation. It was burned into, seared into my conscience, amen, you might say. Uh, but we all struggle sometimes in that area. Think about it. How did Daniel respond when he was uh, told to quit praying? Did he quit praying? No, he didn't quit praying. But when they came to his door and knocked on his door and charged him, did he run, did he hide, or did he willfully go to the magistrates, you might say, or the rulers? He did. And did he allow himself to get thrown in the lion's den? Of course he did. And who ended up getting all the honor and the glory for it? God worked his way out. And we think about that. He was obedient to the magistrates. He didn't try to cause a war. He didn't try to go into hiding. He was obedient to them. We think of that as a, a true story with David. And David uh, didn't try to, uh, to cause divisions with Saul. Amen. He didn't rise up against King Saul. And sure, he did flee. And uh, we look at that. But 
he, he wouldn't kill Saul and he had many opportunities to. He respected to him as a divine authority, you might say. What about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? And they were commanded to bow down and worship that false god. They did not. And then they ended up speaking. It said uh, th this. I said, if it said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this manner. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us uh, from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that uh, we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't go start an army. They said, we're going to serve God. But when they got thrown in the pit, they were willing to die for the cause of Christ. In the end, God got all the honor and glory and was with them in the fire. Amen. We think about the Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, when they came and, uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, all of a sudden Peter got out and took his sword and wanted to start a battle, did he not? And he did. He cut off Malchus's ears. Jesus picked up that ear and healed Malchus. Amen. It wasn't a battle, and he willfully went off to the Jews and was falsely accused. He willfully took a beating and was taken to Pilate. And uh, you, we look about how Jesus was spit upon. And, and what did Jesus say at the very end of that? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots, and we know the end. He passed away. And, and we look at the end of that. Praise God. Up from the grave he arose. Amen. Amen. And we look at, uh, that, that goes on, Stephen. When Stephen was uh, there, he was preaching the word of God, and we imagine the Sanhedrin there, and eventually they got so mad at him, they gnashed at him with his teeth. What did he say? He basically said uh, the same thing as Jesus' Father, forgive them. And uh, the exact words uh, that he used, and he said, and he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And we see that Stephen did not wish ill on those men. Daniel didn't wish ill on uh, the Medes and the Persians. He, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't mean ill to the Babylon, uh, the Bab not the Babylonians, my brain. The Babylon, no. <laughs> it is just one of those nights. I just, Brother Ray, have mercy on me, amen. Uh, he didn't wish him ill, and Jesus didn't wish ill on the, the Pharisees, amen, and the Jewish people, and on Pilate right there. And we think about our dealings with people, sometimes when something doesn't go our way, we want to hurt them. We want to flatten their tires. We want to punch them. We want to take out a sword and chop them. No, we don't really want to. That's, that would sound, that just, that's not a good sound bite. Uh, praise the Lord. Not what I meant. I mean, it's not. Put this them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Now look at this next verse, verse number two. To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. And we think about that. It's very similar to what we're commanded in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speakings be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another, tender hearted forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And, and by the way, this word's leading Christ forgave us, even we ought to forgive other people. And we get to the next verse, verse number three. Look at how it continues on. Now, this is convicting, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Oh, you know, sometimes we don't even realize it. When we're treated wrongly, when people treat us despitefully, uh, wickedly, and we all of a sudden begin to lash out them and want to fight, uh, give, render evil for evil, we lose our testimony. 
we lose our opportunity, you might say, to be a good gospel witness, you might say. And he's saying, hey, we've got to remember the way you treat somebody can help in the long run. Do you remember it helped you? At one time, you were proud. You know, sometimes you were in the wrong and God had mercy on you. We should be merciful because God has been merciful to us. I want you to turn, turn your Bible over, if you will. And I love this portion of Scripture in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. And when I first noticed this, I was reading um, Charles Spurgeon lectures to my students. It was a, uh, a book on uh, basically a pastor's manual and uh, lectures to my students. And the lecture title was Have a Blind Eye and a Deaf Ear. And I remember when I first read that, Have a Blind Eye and a Deaf Ear, what is he talking about? And he referenced this scripture in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 21. Also, read it with me. Also take no heed unto all words that are spoken, lest thou hear thy servant curse thee, for oftentimes also thine own heart knoweth that thou thyself likewise hast cursed others. Ye. He's saying, listen, sometimes if you listen too much, you're going to hear a good person curse you. You're going to hear somebody say something they don't really mean or uh, do something they didn't really mean to do. And you're going to get all worked up about it, but you don't even realize you've been there before. You've done that before. You've said something or did something you shouldn't have done before. And boy, in other words, be merciful to them because somebody had mercy on you. Amen. And you don't know the end result right there, but hey, be merciful. Have a blind eye and a deaf ear. Speaking of a pastor, boy, sometimes in a pastor, there's, there's going to be as a pastor, somebody's going to treat the pastor wrong sometimes. They don't really mean it. It just happens sometimes. And by the way, the pastor should be merciful because, boy, pastors need a lot of mercy in his lifetime too. Pastors said things and done things he ought not have done in the past too. So as people have given me mercy, boy, praise the Lord, I ought to be merciful to them. Have a blind eye and a deaf ear. Oh, what a great verse, that uh, verse 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy. Yesterday... I was witnessing to this fella, and uh, I asked him about heaven. I said, if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you'd go to heaven when you die? He says, nah, I don't believe in all that. And I said, well, what do you believe in? He says, well, I, I thought he said, I believe in an octopus. And uh, I said, but it didn't, I, it was some other word. And he says, well, uh, and it was interesting. He began to give his story. He said, I was going to church when I was a kid. And uh, he said, I read the Bible. And uh, anyways, in a, in a service uh, there, they were having a youth thing, and they were talking about suicide. Here, here's his testimony. They were talking about suicide in the church. And he said, I felt like killing myself at one time. And uh, there were some people I tried to help, some other teenagers I wanted to talk to. And he said, the youth leader got very upset with me that I would give my testimony. And uh, they basically said, I need to shut up. And he said, it made me so mad. I'm not saying he's right for that. But he got mad and uh, left the church, and he began to study his ancestry, and he discovered that his ancestry, he was a Viking. And so he says, now I believe in worshiping my ancestors like the Vikings do. Now think with me. The fellow's been hurt in a time past. I listened to him, and I told him, I said, now listen, I understand what you're saying right there, but from my perspective, this Bible is the Word of God has the answers. It's true from beginning to end. And the Bible says that the ancestor worship is not so good. And one day you're going to have to stand before the Almighty God. And I said it nicely, but I was saying the answer is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I gave him our gospel book. And I said, please, here's my testimony. Read this. Think about this. And you think about it, that opportunity right there, I, I could have been a smart aleck, very much so. I said, said man, it's a good thing they got you out of that church. I could have been a jerk. Do you understand? I'm saying I could have done everything in my power to be obnoxious to him and tell him he's a jerk, but it wouldn't have helped anything. Here is a, a young man who is confused, as confused, as confused, as confused as can be. And he's a soul that the Lord Jesus Christ loves. And he needed somebody to tell him the Bible is the truth. Jesus is the way. In meekness, I'm no better than him. There was a time when I was a scoffer. There was a time when I was disobedient. There was a time when I needed somebody to love me despite of me. 
We have been foolish. Now, look at verse number five, and this is where it gets to. It says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the way, mercy. We think of our mercy once again. We're saved. Now, if I was in to play that game with you, Brother Kyle, mercy right there. Let me see. This. No? Okay. All right, right here. Now, AJ, now be merciful. Like AJ's, well, see, I could real, brother, I could get him. I could, I could get him. Now, see, mercy. see, he said mercy. Blah! No. Mercy right there. I, I could hurt him. Or he could hurt me. Okay, he could hurt me. Okay, Brother Chris? I wasn't, but we think about that. I, I treat him better than he deserves to be treated. God treats me better than I deserve to be treated. Boy, I, I wronged him. I disobeyed him. I've sinned. And you think about it, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And sin is despicable. I deserve to die and go to hell. But not by works of righteousness, not because I'm good, he saved me, because according to his mercy, he saved me. And we think about the mercy of the Lord. When we remember who we are, we're not somebody who is high and lifted up, but our God is somebody who's high and lifted up. And we have to remember that. It's a a simple truth. When you go out there and all of a sudden your anger gets riled up with people and you get upset and you want to slash your tires, you want to beat them up, you want to uh, have a fight with them, all of a sudden you're lifting and elevating yourself to a position you're not meant to be in. And that, that, that seems simple, but it is simple, but it's true. You're beginning to elevate yourself and think you're better than you are. You're a sinner destined uh, d- that deserves to die and go to hell just like everybody else deserves to die and go to hell but we have a great god who loved us and had mercy on us when you see that the next time somebody wrongs you and does something wrong to you pray for them have mercy on them and don't wish any ill toward them hope that the lord uh watches over them and, and you get right with god and, and that's such a vital fight. It's, I'm not sound, maybe saying it the best of ways, but it's one of the greatest truths in the Bible right there on how to deal with people. Because we're no better than anybody else. Amen. We're no better than anybody else. Well, we ought to love people and care for people and praise God for the Lord Jesus Christ doing that for us. Now, if you'll go to this next verse, verse number six, we'll look at this. Which, which he has shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. You see that? Maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Now, when you read this, look, look at me. I don't want you to lose you for a second. This section of Scripture, it does say not by works of righteousness which you've done, but according to His mercy saved us. It's absolutely a wonderful verse that tells us about how salvation, but primarily that portion of Scripture is reminding us how to deal with other people. It's written to say, hey, God had mercy on you and saved you not because of righteousness, because of His mercy. It's saying to you, make sure that you treat other people mercifully. What a great truth. Amen. And it says to maintain good works. In other words, and maintain that thought right there throughout your day. Don't just have one good day where you're good on Sunday, but remember your boss who's treating you wrong. Have, show him show the love of Christ. Boy, that family member that's giving you a hard time, show them the love of Christ. Be merciful to them. Uh, that person who, who cuts you off on Battlefield Boulevard, hey, what, be nice. It was probably me. <laughs> It's probably mean me. Now, a little bit further, it, it then takes a change right here. Verse number nine. Verse number nine. You ready for this? But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and striving about the law, for they are unprofitable in vain. That is interesting. And avoid means you're keeping at a distance and staying away. Sometimes people want to just ask foolish questions. My pastor used to have a question and answer time before the church service on Sunday night. And uh, people would ask him questions. I remember this one kid, he asked him, can God make a rock that is so big that even he can't hold? (laughs) And the pastor just said, sit down and be quiet. (laughs) It was a foolish question. And there was no profit in even trying to answer it. And and by the way, he's avoiding it. 
And by the way, there are some questions we ought to avoid. And sometimes people get off on tangents on questions that, uh, that don't help anybody. Just stay away from them. Keep it at a distance. Stay away. And by that one guy uh, yesterday with the Vikings, uh, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't start going into any of his stuff. I avoided them. I, I cut it short right there. Jesus is the way. The Bible has the answer. Hey, that's it. Hallelujah. Have a nice life. I didn't say it like that, but I, I got out of there. And, and we think with it, uh, sometimes we avoid those things right there and we move on. And sometimes in a church, uh, church members will get in a squabble about a genealogy about a question in the Bible, and they'll begin to cause war in the church or war in a, a family right there over something that's foolish, completely foolish. Verse number 3, or 10, look at this. A man that is a heretic. By the way, a heretic is a man who holds teachings contrary to the Word of God, and that's a heretic. Somebody who holds teachings contrary to the Word of God. The Word of God is our final authority for all matters of faith and practice. Whatever the Bible says, we what? We believe. But a man who is a heretic, somebody who is going contrary to the word of God, after the first and second admonition, reject. Cast off as useless. That's what reject means. You cast them off as useless. <laughs> the DMV, I was talking to, the, to a man. I was uh, trying to give him the gospel. And uh, this man, he said to me, I don't believe the Bible. By the way, G I said, Jesus is the way to heaven. He said, I don't believe the Bible. And uh, it, it was as done as that. He turned around, went and sat down right there. You know, I can't help him. If he doesn't believe the Bible, what can I do? And by the way, that's a heretic. And it's a hard word, but it's a heretic. If you have a heretic in the church, somebody who doesn't believe the Bible, you can admonish him a couple times saying, hey, listen, this is what the Bible says. Hey, here's what, uh, what the Bible says. I, and they say, I don't care what the Bible says. What can you do? I met a man who was in our church probably two years ago. And uh, when he came, nice guy. Uh, but then we began to preach. I preached the message, Jesus is God. By the way, the Bible says very clearly that Jesus is God. Amen. He got wound up, and a uh, nice guy, but he said, I don't believe that Jesus is God. And I said, well, let me show you the Bible. He said, basically, he said, I don't care what the Bible says in a lot of ways. Jesus is not God. I've never thought that Jesus is God. I'm not going to believe that Jesus is God now. And I'm not trying to exaggerate that, but that's basically where he landed right there. I don't wish him any Ill, Ill will, but that's a heretic because the Bible plainly says that Jesus is God. Unless he changes his mind and gets snaps out of that, what is he good for? He's good for nothing. What's he going to help our church? He's not going to help our church at all. He's going to hurt our church. And so he, he needs to get right in that area, submit to the word of God. Otherwise, we reject him, cast him off as useless. And that's, that's hard. Pastor, that's hard. Yeah, that's why we need a pastor's manual that tells us what to do. God's not a respecter of persons. He can be my, it could have been my mom or my dad. It doesn't matter if my mom rejects Jesus being God, she's a heretic. That's not very popular. <laughs> Should not have brought mom into the equation here. Uh, no, Brother Bill, I shouldn't have brought mom into the equation. My mom's not a heretic, praise God. God. Uh, oh, move on. The end right here. Verse number 12. Look at this. When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, be diligent, and, uh, diligent to come unto me in the Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. Bring Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting unto them. And then verse 14, read with me. And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. Continue, all that are with me, salute thee. Greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. Maintain good works. And uh, that chapter is a chapter on how to deal with people, uh, both inside the church and outside the church. The answer is mercy. Treat people better than they deserve to be treated. Remember that God was merciful to you. This week, when you want to get angry at somebody tomorrow because they're treating you wrong, remember the mercy of the Lord on you. Have a blind eye and a deaf ear. And be careful what you say. Be careful what you think. Amen. And it's important for us to be merciful people. Meekness, not lifting yourself up too high or too low. God is a merciful God. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. Thank you for your mercy. And Lord... Uh, 
sometimes it's easy to know this truth, but our emotions sometimes overtake us, Lord. And rather than be spirit-filled, we're filled with our flesh, which has hatred and variance and wrath and malice, Lord. But help us to walk in the spirit, and therefore we not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Help us to remember constantly your mercy. Help us to understand that sometimes our government and people that rule over us will not treat us correctly. Help us to be brave enough to pray, brave enough to call you our God, but help us to also not wish them any ill will, Lord, and wish that they would be like uh, that uh, Darius who cast Daniel into that lion's den who eventually served you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you please bless our church. Help us to be a church that honors you and all that we say, think, and do, Lord. Help us to be a merciful church and realize that when people come to our church, they need somebody to point to them to you, our great Savior, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me, if you will.